Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Alex Avila with Love University, and we're back. I'm an author, psychologist, and speaker. Every week, we talk about how to love ourselves, others, and a higher nature, how to improve our finances, career, relationships, health, and spirituality. And we've been talking about my book, Guy Types, Four Ways to Find the Love of Your Life, a way to determine who's most compatible with you based on personality compatibility. Today, we're going to talk about your love temperament, your unique personality style. Love temperaments originate as far back as ancient times, as philosophers and deep thinkers have sought to classify humans into different personality types. Once you know your love temperament, you will understand yourself better and you will know exactly the type of mate who will fit best with you in a happy long-term relationships. The four love temperaments correspond to four main desires that humans have. The four main motivators in life are knowledge. So we have the knowledge seekers, those people who want to know more, learn more and be competent, and have wisdom. Then we have people that seek fun, what we know as the excitement seekers. They're looking for spontaneity, excitement, and adventure. Then we have those who seek security, also known as the security seekers, those who like tradition, responsibility, and structure. And finally, we have the meaning seekers, people that search for meaning in life, those who try to find the purpose for their existence. They may love psychology, philosophy, spirituality, and the arts. By knowing these four personality types or groups, you can learn a great deal about the person you are and the type of life you will lead, including the romantic and love relationships that work best for you. Many times readers of guide types ask certain questions. Uh, Jonathan, my producer, I want you to ask these questions and I'll answer them based on what readers want to know. Can I be more than one love temperament? Yes, you can. You may have a secondary love temperament, one that is not as strong as your primary one, but that still has influence over your life. For example, your primary love temperament may be excitement seeker. Fun is primary in your life. While your secondary may be security seeker, safety and security is paramount, perhaps because of the way you were raised. In the guide type system, we're going to focus on your main love temperament, the psychological style that you use most of the time. At the same time, it's wise for you to be aware of your secondary love temperament, if you have one because it can also influence your romantic choices. The truth is that all love temperaments are equally valuable. They're just different from each other. Can my love temperament change? Yes, to a certain extent. The truth is that you have a genetic predisposition to a primary or main love temperament. For example, excitement seeker, meaning seeker, security seeker, or knowledge seeker. It is true that you can develop your secondary love temperament as you get older. As you grow older, You can also accentuate the strengths and minimize the weaknesses of your primary love temperament. Research shows that genetic patterns influence which reinforces or rewards you will devote your life to seeking, whether it's fun, meaning, security, or knowledge. You may inherit tendencies or appetites, and the environment you live in can also shape your expression of those desires. How does knowing my love temperament give me a personality cloud? In everyday terms, clout is having influence or power. When we talk about personality clout, we're talking about inner power or the self-confidence that you have when you are true to your natural personality, your love temperament. There's something that occurs in personality type, which is called falsification of type. This is when you express a personality style that is different from your true nature. Unfortunately, this can create a great deal of frustration and disillusionment. For example, you may have been intuitive or imaginative as a child. But your parents insisted that you become a practical individual because they worried that you wouldn't be able to make a living if you, quote-unquote, lived in your fantasy world. As a result, you became what is known as a closet intuitive. You suppress your natural imaginative tendencies and settle for a practical career or lifestyle. By doing this, you discounted an important part of the real you, and you suffer from disorientation and pain as a result. The good news is that you can learn how to recognize and embrace your unique, authentic love temperament. When you accept your true nature, you suddenly feel a surge of self-esteem and confidence that is very attractive to others. You gain what is called personality clout. You have social influence and power, not because of your look, status, or money, but because you are fully aware of and manifest your personality strengths. When you communicate and act from your psychological strengths, You will live from a position of balance, power, and integrity. You will exude a certain aura of quiet confidence that is very appealing to others. And you will attract the type of mate who naturally resonates with your style. How do I determine my love temperament? 
Your first step in finding your ideal love partner is to determine your own personal love temperament, your unique personality style. Your love temperament is made up of three major dimensions of personality. Dimension number one, are you practical or imaginative? Now, we have questions that we ask for each of these dimensions. And Jonathan, my producer, I'm going to ask you the questions. I want you to be very honest with me and upfront about the answer. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Jonathan, what would you do if you won $10 million? Um, as opposed to like being like rappers or spending it on booze and girls, I'd probably try to make my own business, invest in uh, finances, uh, just invest my money in smart uh, business ventures. Okay, Jonathan. So what kind of business venture would you invest in, for example? I guess the dumb one would be Bitcoin. <laughs> Kind of trendy. Okay. From that answer, Jonathan, it sounds like you're kind of a practical guy, kind of realistic and concrete down to earth. Uh, the people that are practical in this context would use the money in a realistic way. They would save and invest, or they would also enjoy it for sensory pleasures, uh, travel, fine dining, and fun activities. On the other hand, if you're the intuitive, you would probably use the money to invent or create something new. You might write the great American novel, start an innovative business to change the world, or you might use it to have a spiritual or mystical experience. Go to the Himalayas and meditate. So let's take a closer look at the intuitive, imaginative versus the practical or sensory person. The sensory practical person prefers specific answers to specific questions. They tend to take things literally. When you ask someone the time and they're a sensor, they prefer to hear 7.35 p.m. As opposed to saying it's time to go, that's too general of an answer. It might make the uh, practical person a little bit irritated. As a sensor, you like to concentrate on what you are doing at the moment. You don't wonder about what's coming next. You would rather do something than just think about it. Because you are more attuned to the practicalities of life, you wonder why some people, the intuitives, spend so much time indulging in their imagination and fantasy. You believe in the phrase, if I see it, I'll believe it. You don't care about your mate's fancy plans for the future as much as they can show you in reality, what they're going to do right now. As a sensor or practical person, when you're in a conversation with your partner, you like to talk about practical real world topics like saving and investing, entertainment, fashion, politics, making a new purchase, online reviews about the best new movie, or planning the details of a vacation trip. When it comes to lovemaking, you're turned on by tactile sensations. You're aroused by clean, nice smelling environments with pleasing sounds and tastes. At the same time, you can be easily turned off by foul odors, noises, and distractions that keep you from fully enjoying the sensuality of the romantic moment. Now, if you're an intuitive or imaginative person, you tend to think about several things at once. Your partner may sometimes accuse you of being absent-minded. You're also a dreamer and someone who finds the future and possibilities intriguing and exciting. As an intuitive, you like to make connections and seek interrelatedness. You ask, what does this mean? You look for meaning and intimacy, and you may also believe in the idea of synchronicity, also known as meaningful coincidences, that things happen for a reason. With your inquisitive mind, you like figuring out how things work just for the pleasure of it. You enjoy talking with your mate about meaning, possibilities, and the esoteric aspects of life. Favorite topics include psychology, philosophy, science, and ideas that can shape the world. When it comes to making love, you're turned on by the unknown, by your ever-active imagination and fantasy life. Sometimes, however, you may be disappointed to find that your romantic fantasy doesn't quite live up to the realities of day-to-day -day life with your partner. So, Jonathan, based on the descriptions that I just gave of the intuitive and the practical person, which one do you think you are now? That's a good question. I feel like I'm more intuitive than practical. Well, Jonathan, in your initial answer to the question, you said you would uh, buy Bitcoin and invest it and things like that. So why do you think you're more intuitive or imaginative than practical? I feel like investing your money in a solid foundation, even if it is kind of sketchy, is more intuitive. I feel like practically, I'm just more creative in general. And I always think that the sky's the limit in many circumstances. So you're kind of a dreamer, uh, Jonathan? Is that what you're saying? A little bit caught up in your imagination? Sadly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sadly. Now, those are good things, too. Um, imaginative people can make great inventions and change the world, but sometimes they lose track of reality. And that's an important thing to talk about. So, Jonathan, when you have reservations, like you just told me about your type, it brings up something that a lot of people have, and that's 
the inability to be authentic uh, and to really embrace who they really are. They think that what they have is not the best uh, personality style, for example, the male feeler, or if you're too intuitive, people think you're too pie in the sky, or if you're too practical, they think you're a stick in the mud. Or if you're too logical, as a female, they think you're not feminine enough or emotional enough. So Jonathan, has ever happened to you where you didn't really embrace your type? I feel like depending on my mood, if I'm angry, hungry, sad, happy, I'm a different personality type, just depending on, it's like the weather, it's always changing. Okay, Jonathan, but you just told me you're a feeler because it depends on your mood. So you just uh, express who you are. And again, the key is, love your university students, is to embrace your real nature, whatever it might be, your authenticity, and then you will naturally attract the soulmate for you. Question number two, uh, dimension number two, it has to do with whether you're a thinker or a feeler. So Jonathan, I'm going to ask you this question. What's your favorite movie and why do you like it? I guess, just off the top of my head, I like Interstellar. It's a space movie. It's very technologically forward and has a pretty good message about just loving your family, but also like brings the greater question of like us as a humanity, like what we should do to continue our legacy, I guess. Okay, that's pretty well said, Jonathan. I'm impressed. You're a movie buff, it sounds like. <laughs> but also initially started talking about the logical side of it, it was a well-done movie and, and, and intergalactic. But you also mentioned family and you mentioned uh, the word love. So it sounds like you're maybe more a little more of a feeler as well or emotional style person. The key to this question in determining if you're a thinker or a feeler, by the way, thinker means that you make decisions primarily based on your logic and analysis and what you believe is right and true. And the feeler makes decisions based on their emotions and their values and how things will impact our relationship. The key here is not just the movie itself, but why you liked it. Some people would say, I really liked Titanic. Now, if you liked it because of the relationship, the love story, the, even the tragic deep part of it, and the way it made you feel, you're a feeler. You might likely make decisions based on your emotions, as we discussed, and relationships. But if you liked Titanic because of the story, the plot, the special effects, how it was made, it made you think, then you're likely the thinker. You tend to make decisions based on your logic and analysis. Although Titanic may be perceived as a romantic movie for feelers, thinkers may like it for entirely different reasons that are logical. So when we analyze the movie question, the key is to look into the precise reasons, logical or emotional, why you like the movie. So if you're a thinker, personality, you communicate to get things done, to improve things. You have a language of action and results. Your main concern in communication is that you will be wrong, look incompetent, or lose the argument. Consequently, if you feel that your intelligence or competence is being challenged, you'll have a tendency to fight back, debate, or argue. And because you're good at it, you will usually win the argument. For the most part, you're more transactional than relational. You enter communication or human interaction with a transactional mindset. You have a definite purpose in mind. For example, to exchange value. Instead of merely to feel good or build a relationship, which is more relational. You're looking to accomplish something as a thinker. And you want to interact with people who can help you do that. And you're willing to offer equal value in return. As a thinker, you would consider yourself to be more firm-minded than gentle-hearted. You can stay calm, cool, and collected when everyone is upset. Also, you would rather settle a dispute based on what is fair and truthful instead of what makes people happy. If you're in a relationship with a feeler, you can get turned off by too much sentimentality and touchy-feely affection from your partner. You also tend to think that feelers take things too personally, and can be weak-minded. Instead, you prefer to be direct and sometimes blunt in what you say. If someone looks bad in an article of clothing, you will tell them. Not to hurt their feelings, but to help them look better. You want to cut through the BS and get to the point you believe that relationships work better when they do. So that, that shirt makes you look fat. Maybe a common thinker would say, not to hurt the other person, but because they actually do look overweight with that shirt, and they want them to change it to look better. When it comes to relationships, and especially lovemaking, you're turned on by intellectual stimulation and compatibility. A smart person turns you on sexually, even though they may not be your typical hunk or beauty. As a prelude to making love, you may start the evening by watching a witty play and engaging in fun verbal sparring, spiced with a tad of sarcasm. Afterward, you will take your partner back to your place for some wine tasting and an intense political or philosophical discussion. Top off by a trip to your bedroom for some heated lovemaking. Let's face it, you know the truth. Brains are sexy, also known as sapiophile. On the other hand, if you're a feeler, 
You're concerned about people's feelings. And if a statement may hurt someone's feelings, you may not say it. For you, communication is meant to build and maintain relationships. You speak to connect with others, especially your mate. Because your focus is on being diplomatic and not hurting people's feelings, thinkers may sometimes accuse you of not being 100% truthful because you don't always say what's on your mind or what needs to be said from the thinker's point of view. Rather than tell someone that they look fat in a shirt, which may be the actual truth, you would rather soften it by saying, you look nice. In your mind, you spoke the emotional truth rather than the logical or literal truth because you valid the integrity of the relationship. And to you, that is the ultimate truth or reason for communicating in the first place. At the same time, when others say to you, you take things too personally, you may disagree because for you, life and relationships are to be taken personally. That's what makes it all worthwhile in the first place. In contrast to your thinking counterpart, you are more relational than transactional when it comes to interacting with others. You're more interested in the relationship you're creating, even if it's only a temporary one with someone you just met, than the transaction with the person, the exchange of value or information. Before you continue an interaction, you want to have a feeling that the other person accepts you as a real human being. As a feeder, you have a great deal of empathy for your mate. You tend to put yourself in their shoes. Because you care so much, you may overextend yourself meeting your partner's needs, even at the expense of your own comfort. When this happens, you may feel resentful because you are not appreciated for your efforts. Now, if you're a feeler, you probably love romance, verbal, and physical affection. Kisses, hugs, back rubs, flowers, candy, midnight walks on the beach, and intimate romantic moments. After making love, your favorite words to hear are, I love you. For the thinker, after they make love, they might say, that kind of suture position, number 65, was 89 out of 100. We can do a little better next time. So it's a whole different approach to relationships, the thinker versus the feeler. So based on those elements, uh, Jonathan, I just described, which one do you say you are, thinker or feeler? I feel like I'm a little bit of both, but overall... Well, you know, like for relationships, I'm more of a feeler for sure, which I usually get in, you know, in trouble for afterwards. Okay. You keep using the word trouble. So uh, I guess a male feeler, and we mentioned this before, can have certain challenges because people are not used to them. Uh, The sensitive, romantic type. And also, Jonathan, you did give a keyword. You said, uh, I feel. So use the word feel. Uh, It's very interesting because you bring me to the next point, which is the idea of the gender gap. Now, a friend of mine, John Gray, wrote a best-selling book, uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. He's been on the show several times. Uh, he's a great thinker and um, wonderful philosopher. And his whole idea that men and women are very different in terms of their personalities. For example, men try to solve problems in a logical way, and women want to express their emotions. But in reality, I believe that the truth is that it's not necessarily gender-based, but it's personality type-based. For example, thinkers are from Mars and feelers are from Venus. Research shows that 56% of men are classified as thinkers. They go by their logic and analysis. While 75% of women are classified as feelers. They go by their emotions and values. A lot of it has to do with upbringing and societal expectations. Men are supposed to be strong and logical, while women are supposed to be emotional and nurturing. But in reality, this dimension is not just about gender, as I mentioned, since approximately 44% of men are feelers. They're sensitive. And approximately 25% of females are thinkers, logical and analytical. Typically, non-traditional types in this dimension have not been looked upon favorably. The male feeler has been accused of lacking masculine power, which is not true, since he can be strong and sensitive. And the female thinker has been accused of being too pushy and unfeminine, even though the reality is that she can maintain her logical mindset and feminine style at the same time. The key is to embrace your style, whether thinker or feeler, and recognize the strengths that each preference brings to the table. So love university students, as we go deeper into the personality type theory and application of guy types, we're going to find out really who you really are, what's your deep nature, what's your personality style like, and how to find someone that resonates with your personality, with your true essence, whether it's the meaning seeker, the person that values meaning, psychology, philosophy, spirituality, the excitement seeker who values fun, spontaneity, adventure, the security seeker who values security, tradition, responsibility, family, and the knowledge seeker who values competence, intelligence, wisdom, and learning. That's true that all of us have 
these different elements in our personality. Sometimes we want to have fun or learn something or have security or basically find the meaning. But we do have a preference. We have a, a unique and distinct style that predominates our life, whether it's one of those four we talked about. And it's important that you find someone that is similar to your personality for a long-term compatible relationship. So as we learn more about this, we're going to talk about all the unique characteristics of the guy types and how to find that ideal partner. So love your university students. If you want to be on the show, if you have a show question, if you want to participate in any way, you can visit us at loveuniversity.love. Call us at 310-226-8090. You can like and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Love University Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at Love You Podcast. Also, you can pick up a copy of the book, Guy Types, Four Ways to Find the Love of Your Life on Amazon.com. You can also subscribe to us on Podbean, Spotify, SoundCloud, and iTunes. So until next time, love your university students. Go out there this week and start to ask some of these questions that we're talking about, what I call the magic questions, to identify people's personality types. Are they a thinker? Are they a feeler? Are they practical or imaginative? And next week, we're going to talk about the other two dimensions of personality, which has to do with structure, spontaneity, and also what we call introversion, extroversion, the internal or external person. So until next time, this is Dr. Alex Avila. Love University. Put away your notebooks, your iPads, your books, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>